Thomas Kissinger with you again, and this is going to be Free Will versus Ownership, Part 7, and we've been reading from this booklet by Dr. Stephen Jones. So thankful for the information. It's so tremendous. Christianity needs to take the time to apply themselves to understand this information, to understand our God is the Creator, He's the owner of all things, He's responsible and liable for what He has created to bring restoration, to send the best of His own, and to make an ultimate restoration for this fall of Adam, because that's who our Father is. He's a winner. He's not a loser. Adam brought everything down into a universal fall. And as you will see, if you apply yourself to understand the information, Jesus Christ has brought everything back and it will result in a universal salvation which will affect the entire human race in the fullness of time. We're stepping into chapter two in this teaching, ownership and liability. This is where it really gets exciting and we get into what is really the real issue of what this is all about. And here he says, I want to shift this whole issue of free will to what I believe is the real issue. The question of free will is really a side issue. The real issue is not free will, but ownership. It is not about the right of man to exercise free will. It is about God's right as creator to exercise his free will. We will go through the scriptures and the law to show you this. Genesis 1.1 says, here we go, let's start at the beginning. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. This is always a good place to start, the beginning. Do we all believe that God was the creator? Or do some people believe that the devil created the earth? The ancient Greeks believed that the devil was the one responsible for the creation of matter material things because they believed that matter was inherently evil. They could not see how a good God would create evil matter. Their basic premise was incorrect. Physical matter was created and pronounced good at every stage of creation. And you can look at Genesis 1.10, verse 12, 18, 21, 25, and 31 to back this up. Thus, the most important and basic premise of understanding the truth is that, number one point, God is the Creator and that He pronounced it good. As Christians, we believe that the God of the Bible is the one who created. He is a good God, not a bad God, and that this God of the Old Testament is not different from the God of the New Testament. God created all things, including man. In chapter 2, verse 7, we read the following. And the Lord God, Yahweh, formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Note here that man was formed of the dust of the ground. This ground or this earth from which man was formed was something that God had created in Genesis 1.1. So the devil did not create. God created the earth and then formed and shaped man out of this material that he had created, Genesis 2.7. That is why it is dust to dust, ashes to ashes. When we die, our bodies return to dust. They return to the elements of the ground from which our bodies were originally created. Turn to Leviticus 25, 23 through 24. The land shall not be sold forever, for the land is mine. This is what God is saying. For you are strangers and sojourners with me, and in all the land of your possession you shall grant a redemption for the land. These are God's land laws. The land must always be redeemed. This is God's law. On what basis does God have land laws? Remember when Israel went into the land of Canaan. 
Joshua divided up all the land among the citizens of Israel, first among the tribes and then to each family. They all had a land inheritance. Yet even though they inherited the land, they were not given absolute sovereignty over the land. They were tenants on God's land. There were conditions to which they were subjected. Man had authority over the land, but God retained sovereignty. That's one of the main points we're going to see in all of this is man has God given authority, but God has absolute sovereignty. Today, we call it eminent domain. The government claims eminent domain over your land so that if it wants to build a highway, it can come in and condemn your land. Basically, they can come in and buy it. You are subject to them and you do not have a whole lot of choice in the matter. Ultimately, the government claims eminent domain over your land. In the same way, God claims eminent domain over your land as well. Believe it or not, Christians who are wanting to trumpet their absolute message of total unlimited free will and free moral agency. Yeah, God's the creator and he owns the land and God created you and he owns you. So you were made of the dust of the ground, material that God created. Your body is your land inheritance. But because you did not create yourself, you do not own yourself. God owns you by right of creation. His sovereignty then is based upon his rights of ownership over creation. Though man has been given a level of authority over his land inheritance, he does not actually own it. God owns it. God owns everything, ladies and gentlemen, including us. So when God gave Israel the land of Canaan as their inheritance, they were not given sovereignty as creators. They were given only limited authority over the land. The Greek New Testament uses two different words to describe sovereign power and authority. Dunamis is power, Acts 1.6. Exousia is authority, Matthew 8.9. These terms are relative. A man under authority looks up to a higher power. But that same man may have people under him who look to him as a higher power. Thus, a man may have power over men, but at the same time is under authority given by a higher power. We often speak of a king being a sovereign or having sovereignty over the citizens of the nation he rules. Yet at the same time, that same king is subject to the king of kings. Thus, the earthly king has authority under God to execute the will of God. Kings are not supposed to act according to their own free will. If they rule by their own will, God will hold them accountable. It is the great deception of kings that God gave them absolute power even to overrule the will of God and His laws by their own free will. God retained sovereignty. Man was given authority that was subordinate to his sovereignty. Everyone needs to know that distinction. Authority is always limited by the will of the one who is sovereign. So we needed to establish that point there that God is the creator. And because God created everything, he owns what he creates. And we must understand that as Christians. Yes, we have a will and we have some level of God-given authority, but the very fact that God has given us authority means that all of it points back to Him because it came from Him. But we're laying this as a base and as the groundwork for what we're going to talk about coming up next in that when you create something, you own it. And when you own it, you're liable for it. And you can do what you want with your property. And what God has decided to do with His property, which is the human race, the Adam race, in Adam all die, is to save it, to reconcile it, restore it, and redeem it back to Himself. And Jesus made that sovereign declaration. He said, if I be lifted up from the earth, speaking of His death on the cross, 
his death, burial, and resurrection. He said, I will drag or draw all men to myself. And that's what's going to happen, and that's what is happening. And Jesus paid it all. And guess what? As I always like to say, Jesus paid it all, and you better believe He's going to get everything that He paid for. Hallelujah.